All right, it is my great pleasure to introduce Justine to you. I've known Justine for many years. She's grown ever powerful with the advancement of time. She's gonna tell you today about some of her great research on middle boxes. Uh, she's done some really great stuff in this area. She's got some best paper awards from uh, SIGCOM and SDI, which are two of the uh, top notch uh, conferences in our field. And so uh, she's also won uh, several prestigious fellowships, such as the one from Microsoft. Uh, and so without further ado, I'll give the microphone over to Justine. Thanks, James. So before we get going, uh, these folks are absolutely awesome. And without them, none of the work I'm going to talk about today would have been possible. When I began studying computer networks, I was told that they look something like this picture here. We have our local network, like at this campus or an enterprise, and inside of it we have our hosts and some number of routers and switches. And what we're told in networks class is that networks do exactly one thing. They deliver packets to their destination. Unfortunately, this is a very oversimplified picture of networks. It's so oversimplified that I call it a myth. It's oversimplified because over time, we've demanded that our networks do more and more. For example, we know that some senders on the internet are dangerous, and that's why we deploy firewalls to block them from communicating to us. We know what malicious traffic looks like, and we want our networks to block it. Hence, we deploy intrusion detection systems. We know that network bandwidth consumption is expensive, and so we deploy WAN optimizers to compress traffic. And we know that we can make web pages load faster by caching them closer to the end hosts who want to access their data. I could go on and on. There are a wide range of devices that implement a bunch of useful features in our networks. And we call these devices middle boxes. So all in all, our networks are just more complicated than we thought. Over time, there's been a growing recognition that middle boxes exist, but that they also introduce problems, as I'm going to elaborate on in a minute. So the questions that I started out with in my research career were, what do these deployments look like in detail? And what challenges do they introduce in practice? And how might we build them better? Hence, one of the first things that I did as a PhD student was to perform a survey of 57 enterprise networks to understand the state of middle box deployments today. And one of the first things we observed was very surprising. What we see here is a box plot of the number of devices in a network. And we've broken things down by the size of the company responding to our survey, with the smallest companies in green and the largest ones in blue. And what we see here is that the number of middle boxes is proportional to the number of routers and proportional to the number of switches. So roughly one in three devices in a given enterprise is middle box. Here we see the same box plot. But now we've broken the middle boxes down by category. So the firewalls are separated out from the WAN optimizers, the WAN optimizers are separated out from the IDSs, et cetera. And the key thing to note here is that there are a wide range of heterogeneous devices all in popular use. So this is very different from the old world of just routers and switches, all of which implement essentially the same functionality, forwarding. Middle box hardware sales are a $10 billion industry, but hardware costs alone aren't the only cost of deployment. What we see here is a scatter plot with the number of devices on the x-axis and the number of administrators managing them on the y-axis. This goes up to hundreds of individuals. So these are not only expensive devices, but the cost to manage them are also high. Some administrators report spending as much as 10 hours a week dealing with failures. And overwhelmingly, the majority of administrators spoke of misconfiguration as their most common cause of downtime. This speaks to the complexity that comes with middle box heterogeneity. There are a lot of devices, each with their own expertise required, and it's simply very easy to get things wrong. Many other administrators spoke of spending time addressing physical and electrical outages or overload. These administrators complained of lacking a cost-effective solution to actually recover from these kinds of outages. Yes? Uh, sorry to jump the floor. Feel free to ignore, but why were IDSs more prone to power problems? Is that just sort of in the noise, or is there actually a reason? I don't know. That's a great question. Not sure. There's a, a Microsoft research study 
uh, that looks at middle box failures and details, but I don't think they looked at IDSs in particular. I think they focused mostly on firewalls and load balancers. Oh, now I have to go through the animations again. All right, so let's recap. Uh, middle boxes are widely deployed and in huge numbers. They make our networks look very different from what they looked at before. Middle boxes introduce high capital and operating expenses. Management is time consuming and error prone. And finally, physical and overload failures cause outages. So my research proposes an alternative architecture for how we should deploy and operate middle boxes. And the key idea is to take this messy enterprise network like this and turn it into this. That is, we want to outsource middle boxes to the cloud. Few companies manage their own mail or storage servers anymore, and I think middle boxes should be no different. And if cloud solutions have made mail and storage systems cheaper and easier to manage, cloud solutions can also deliver that same promise for networking infrastructure. This is kind of an obvious proposal, but it's also simultaneously a crazy one. It may seem obvious because, hey, we've been outsourcing everything to the cloud, so why shouldn't middle boxes be next? But to networking folks, this can seem a little bit crazy. We spend a lot of time optimizing the path from point A to point B over dedicated hardware that we've really specialized here. And now we're going to reroute this traffic, send it to this cloud thing, and we expect it to work just the same. Nonetheless, the promises look pretty good. If we return to the challenges that we saw from before, things start to follow a very familiar story from the arguments we heard for why people would outsource storage and compute to the cloud as well. When it comes to high capital and operating expenses, the cloud can offer economies of scale and the ability to pay per use. Where management is time consuming and error prone, the cloud can offer simplified configuration for enterprise administrators who offload most of the work to experts at the cloud who solve it once and for all for everybody. And where physical and overload failures cause outages, the cloud can offer redundant resources for scaling and failover. Nonetheless, it's unclear that we can simply take middle boxes out of the enterprise and just put them in the cloud. And there are two technical questions that we need to answer. The first question is whether or not it's feasible from a wide area perspective. Can I really just detour all my traffic to the cloud and not hurt performance? And as an enterprise, if I take all my middle boxes out of my network and put them in the cloud instead, will I really get the same benefits? That's the first thing we're going to talk about today. I'm going to present to you a system called APLOM, which you can think of as a feasibility study for whether or not this outsourcing idea is indeed a good idea from the enterprise's perspective. The second question we'll need to answer is whether or not we can actually build this in the cloud. So middle boxes are very different from traditional cloud services. They sustain very high throughputs and ultra low latencies. And hence, we're going to have to rethink many classic cloud challenges and engineer them with these performance constraints in mind. The three pieces of work that I've done in these space are FTMB, which provide fault tolerance, Blindbox and Embark, which provide security, and Silo, which provides bandwidth and latency guarantees in a cloud data center. To start, though, let's talk about this wide area question and look at APLOM. At a high level, APLOM is answering two questions to tell us whether or not this wide area question is feasible. First, can we provide equivalent functionality to the middle boxes that enterprises use today, but deployed in the cloud instead? And second, is it possible to do so without prohibitive performance overheads? Here's how it works. We start by removing all those middle boxes we had, and we're going to put them up here in the cloud. Where we're going to replace that big mess and tangle of wires with one box. We're going to call this our Aplom Gateway. And the Aplom Gateway maintains a tunnel to and from the cloud. And we'll keep this tunnel encrypted. Now, when a client wants to send data out to the internet, it's going to hit this Aplom Gateway first. And instead of going directly to its destination, it'll be sent down the tunnel to the cloud where it receives some sequence of processing operations, and then is sent out to the internet at large. When someone on the internet wants to send data back to the enterprise, it once again does not follow a direct path. We use a combination of the DNS and network address translation to make sure that the traffic is sent to the cloud first, 
where it receives processing before it's sent back down the tunnel and to the enterprise. Now, there are a lot more details about how the redirection works, how we handle multiple data centers and performance optimizations, but after this discussion, what I really want to talk about is our implementation, so let's skip to that. We've built APLUM and deployed it on seven EC2 data centers across the United States. And we used some new code and some open source code that we stitched together to generate our APLOM system. We implemented two types of clients. We had a virtual APLOM gateway that you could run on your local laptop and it would redirect just your traffic to and from the cloud. And then we had a physical software router that you could plug into that would do all the redirection for you, more like the physical gateway that we saw in the picture. Now we can return to the first question that APLOM addresses. Will the performance overheads be too high? And the first thing that we asked was whether or not latency would increase. Here's the experiment that we did. From 100 US universities, we had each university measure the latency to communicate between that pair, and then the latency to redirect through an EC2 data center instead. We then subtracted one from the other and came up with an inflation value, or a delta. Now here, we're going to look at a cumulative distribution function of all of those delta values. And what we see, surprisingly, is that for 60% of those pairs, that inflation value was actually negative. That is, it was faster to redirect through APLOM than to take the default internet path. Yes? So is that equivalent to saying that the services you were testing for didn't have a lot of good edge servers close to clients? In other words, I'm trying to disentangle whether or not this is... Uh, okay, so the latency coming in and out of a middle box is under 100 microseconds. So the minute we're in millisecond land, we're not talking about the devices themselves, we're talking about the wide area latency. Um, now, this result is consistent with these old results in networking that basically show that internet routing follows very non-optimal paths. BGP isn't great, it's optimizing off of a cost metric. And what's exciting here is that EC2 is so well connected that just by using these EC2 data centers, you can get 60% better paths, or sorry, you can get better paths 60% of the time. Okay, so yeah, that's, that's why they're better. BGP, non-optimal, EC2, very well connected. So this is great. Yes? About the cost of moving some of those caches off to the cloud? So for a cache, a local cache, um, you're not going to be able to get the same latency benefit as if you put them in the cloud. Yeah, that would definitely, yeah, be, a that would definitely be bad. So the performance, there are some measurements about the, the latency of going to Akamai versus Amazon in the paper. Um, but the performance benefits you're going to get are basically more like the benefits you get from having a CDN for everything rather than having a cache locally. It's still sort of better than, than going far, but it's not as good as having a local cache. So we also looked at a multinational enterprise rather than just universities, and we did the same experiment. And in between sites of this multinational enterprise, we saw that there was a median latency penalty of about one millisecond. And so those sites which did experience inflation were sites where EC2 does not have many data centers. So these were branches of the company in places like East Asia or South America. But latency isn't the only metric that matters. We also looked at download times. We saw that download times uh, in increased by about 2.3%. And we also looked at jitter, which is this funny metric that basically measures the glitchiness of a connection. So when you're watching a Skype call or a video or something, you want your packets to come through smoothly, evenly paced. Now if they start to bunch up, then you get bursts of data here, and then you have to wait a little bit more for the next amount. So what this metric is telling us is that the packets were coming through smoothly. And we can expect Skype calls and videos to come through smoothly as well. The other thing we wanted to know from APLOM, besides these performance questions, were whether or not we could provide equivalent functionality for each middle box. In implementing APLOM, we had an existence proof that it was indeed possible. We could outsource all but one category of middle box. The devices that we can't outsource are internal middle boxes, and they're almost always firewalls. Internal firewalls prevent one region of a company from talking to another. So you can imagine that I might want to say to the folks in sales that they can't access servers in R&D. 
Now, in order to outsource a device like this, which operates strictly on traffic that's local to the enterprise, I would have to bounce everything out to the cloud and come back, which would be pretty expensive. Hence, we don't outsource them. These are a small fraction of the devices, however, and so by outsourcing everything except the internal middle boxes, a large enterprise in our survey would go from about 300 middle boxes on average down to 24. And a very large enterprise in our survey would go from about 2,000 middle boxes down to 28. Okay, so that concludes our discussion of Aplomb. And our survey told, or our study told us that outsourcing was indeed feasible without prohibitive overheads and enabling us to outsource the middle boxes we wanted for the enterprise. Yes? I guess there is another uh, option of kind of a virtual uh, outsourcing where you keep the traffic as it is, but just uh, outsource the brain of, uh, just have the uh, middle box uh, where its brain is managed by some dedicated. Right. So what's so the pros and cons of the biggest difference between that and what we're proposing here is that all of the sort of complexity associated with the physical management of the infrastructure remains local. So you still have a lot of devices there. You still don't have the ability to say scale up and scale down um, and take advantage of the cost benefits of the cloud. Um, you don't have the redundant resources you need for failover. But it's true that you could have some you know, specialized company that would come in and manage the, site, uh, the devices for you locally and that would make some of the management easier. Now that we've talked about APLOM as a wide area architecture, we now need to roll up our sleeves and talk about how we're actually going to implement these kinds of services. And so as an example of, of one of the challenges we'll need to address, I want to talk about fault tolerance, which we knew was a challenge from our survey when we saw that there were all of these physical and overload outages. The need for high reliability actually becomes even more pressing now that we're in this cloud context. Because cloud providers are offering guaranteed uptime and service level agreements that they all want to be higher than their competitors. So here's Amazon offering 99.95% availability. Azure offering the same. And Cloudflare offering the seemingly crazy 100% uptime. And underneath there it says without qualification. So if you violate these guarantees, they have to pay their clients money. And everyone's trying to have a better guarantee rather than their competitors. Now in order to meet an SLA like this, when something inevitably does break down, you're going to need a way to automatically recover. And so in order to design a fault tolerant middle box or an FTMB, I'm going to talk about three challenges we'll need to address and then we'll design a system. These challenges are statefulness, high performance, and non-determinism, and I'll go through them one by one. First, state. So most middle box applications maintain state about ongoing connections. For example, a network address translator keeps a mapping of private and public addresses. And if this data is lost, connections are reset and users complain. If I have a security appliance, like an intrusion detection system, the device keeps records of user behaviors, protocols they use, messages they've sent in the past. And if all of this goes missing, attacks may sneak by undetected. And as a final example, my ISP keeps records of my usage behaviors. They need this information to bill me at the end of the month. And if this data goes missing, I will be very happy. My ISP will not. So the key takeaway here is that each class of device has its own kind of state. And there are going to be different failure modes if this data goes missing during our recovery. Next, let's talk about high performance. For those of you who are not Eddie Kohler, middle boxes have very tight performance requirements, which are achieved by heavy parallelism. So here we have two packets that have come in. They're serial. They're coming in on the wire, and they've arrived at our network interface card. Now, we want to split them out so they can be processed by multiple cores. So the network interface card is going to write them in to different queues, each queue feeding in to a different processor. Now, each core is going to independently come in one by one, pick up the packets, and apply whatever advanced processing they want to. And they can do this in parallel at the same time. Once they're done operating over that data, they can write them out to an output queue. Now note that each core here has its own dedicated input queue and its own dedicated output queue. 
This saves them from having to coordinate with each other and say, hey, is this your packet or is this mine? There's no locking, there's no contention here, because each one is reading and writing to their own cues. Now the output NIC from the output cues is going to read in from each queue one by one and write the data out to the network. So notice, this is a highly parallel system. The parallelism in the middle box allows it to forward at millions of packets per second. And the end-to-end -end latency from when a packet is read in, and queued, processed, and finally released is under 100 microseconds. Now, there's one place where this perfect parallelism breaks down, and that's shared state. So middle boxes keep state about active connections. We've already talked about this a bit. Here we have two variables, x and y. And they may represent some sort of aggregate behavior, something about a collection of users or a collection of flows. And because lots of different processors, lots of different cores are going to have to access this data, it's shared between cores. Now, middleback's architects try to get rid of this state as much as possible. It's very expensive to share data between different cores. But inevitably, some of this stuff sticks around. And that's where parallelism breaks down infrequently. Our final challenge is that middle boxes are non-deterministic, and this is due to their combination of parallelism and shared state. So this is a classic problem. Middle non-determinism crops up whenever you have this glorious combination of parallelism and shared state. Just to walk through an example, we can actually imagine a middle box that simultaneously exists in two universes at the same time. And in each universe, non-deterministic events turn out slightly differently. So here come two packets, serial, back to back. Everything's good and deterministic here. The network interface card uses a deterministic hash function to decide which packets go into which queues. So once again, our two universes are going to remain the same. But at this point, they're going to start to diverge. And the reason they're going to diverge is that it's very difficult to tell which core is going to pick up which packet first. Each core has a slightly different clock schedule, different interrupt schedule, different tasks they were assigned previously. So it's hard to tell who's going to get to their packet first. So in universe one, the red packet is picked up first, and in universe two, the orange packet is picked up first. Now let's say that the middle box is keeping a counter in the variable x. And what each core is going to do is it's going to increment that counter, and the packet is going to carry out the value of the counter with it. So here, different packets are assigned the value 7. And then when the next packets come in, once again, different packets are assigned the value 8. And what we're seeing here is that this can lead to different system output or even different final system state. So that's our third and final challenge. Now, at this point, you may be asking, all right, those are some challenges. I've heard about most of those before. Why can't we just use an off-the-shelf fault-tolerant solution to solve all of these problems? Unfortunately, existing approaches fail when confronted with all three challenges at once. Now, a typical fault tolerance approach that people might have taken in the networking community would actually be to just reset everything. You'd reset the connections and revert the system to cold start. But this can lead to incorrect behavior and performance problems. In experiments, we showed that many applications can actually take minutes to recover from resets. Checkpointing is a classic approach which periodically takes a copy of all system state. To recover, you simply reload the last checkpoint you took, and then you're ready to go. Now, the trick is, is that under normal operation, you check these, take these checkpoints on an interval. And in between each checkpoint, you have to buffer outputs before releasing them. This buffering leads to a cost of poor latency. Yet another class of solutions, active-active approaches, keep two running copies of a system. And you mirror all inputs to both running systems. Assuming the system you're concerned with is deterministic, they'll reproduce the same behavior, and you'll have two faithful replicas of the running system. But middle boxes are very non-deterministic. Just feeding in the same data to two copies doesn't mean they're going to do the same thing or generate the same state. And so this means that most systems, when applied to middle boxes, either don't work or slow down to a crawl. 
Finally, yet a fourth class of approaches rely on deterministic replay. We're going to store all system inputs, and upon failure, we'll replay these inputs through a backup to restore lost state. So these solutions both restore state and they do provide mechanisms to counteract non-determinism. But consequently, they usually provide poor throughput and sometimes poor latency as well. But we're not going to reject that approach. FTMV is a replay-based approach, but it doesn't have the performance problems of the systems we rejected on the previous slide. And FTMV is fast because it uses two new techniques called ordered logging and parallel release. So here's our replay architecture. Without FTMB, packets throw through a middle box like so. Now in a replay-based recovery system, you need to store every input the system ever processed. So the upstream switch from the master middle box will take a copy of every packet we see before we feed it into the master. At the master, as we process the packet, the master middle box is going to generate some metadata. We're going to call this a packet access log. Now this metadata is recording non-deterministic events. We'll talk more about where it comes from later, but just remember that this metadata is what we need to counteract for non-determinism. We'll store this metadata at the downstream switch from the master middle box. Finally, we'll periodically take full VM snapshots of the running system. And this ensures that if the master fails, we don't have to replay everything that happened since the middle box started up, just the last k milliseconds since we last took a snapshot. OK, so we've logged three pieces of data here, the input packets, the snapshots, and the packet access logs. And together, this is what allows us to reconstruct lost state after middle box fails. On failure, we'll reload the last snapshot. Then we'll feed into the snapshot all of these packet access logs, the things that allow us to counteract uh, non-determinism. And once we've loaded those up, we can read in all of the input packets we logged in between the last snapshot and when the master went down. Once we've replayed all of those input packets, we can now declare that our backup here is a faithful replica of the master when it went down and start reading in new packets. Okay, so, so far, so good. Now, so far, what we've seen is a really classic replay architecture. So what is it that makes replay-based approaches slow? Well, I'm going to argue that it's this. It's this process of identifying where the non-determinism comes from and making sure it's reliably stored. And you have to think about this carefully in order to make sure that it doesn't introduce high overheads, and that's what ordered logging and parallel release make fast. The reason that most approaches slow down is that they require many accesses to data that's shared between cores. To read data that belongs to another core is going to give you a 20 to 40 nanosecond cost per hit to the shared data. On average, a core has less than a microsecond between when it picks up a packet and needs to finish writing it out to the next queue so that it can pick up the next packet and go. So these numbers add up very quickly. So classic replay approaches require a lot of these cross-core accesses. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. First, let me show you what we need to log and why we inevitably require some of these cross-core accesses, even in FTMB. So recall, non-determinism arises when we have a data race. These packets are going to come in, and it's not quite clear who's going to get to that variable x first, red or orange. And whoever wins the race gets to update the variable first. So what we need to know in order to replay this event, this race, is the order in which each core got to the variable x. And that's what we log in our packet access logs. So here we have a record that says red accessed x first. When orange gets there, we'll create a record saying orange accessed x second. We're going to do this by adding a counter into the lock, if there isn't a counter already, that protects that shared state variable. Every time a core accesses that lock, it's going to increment the counter and generate one of these records. Now, here's where things start to get tricky. To guarantee correct recovery, we have to guarantee at all times that we can replay the system 
up to the very last packet that it released. Now, this is really important. If I release a packet right now, I am promising to any user who sees that packet that should the master go down in this very instant, I can reconstruct the middle box up to this very moment where I let that packet go. Up to this very moment, I have state that's consistent with my having released that packet. So here's a naive approach that we could use to guarantee this requirement. And it's naive because although it's fast, it isn't quite correct. And we're going to explore this approach looking at both the middle box here and the output logger where we store the packet access logs. So here's our naive idea. These packets are coming in, they're updating variables, they're generating packet access logs, and each packet is going to carry its own packet access log with it. Now this is a fast design in that it avoids our concerns of cross-core accesses slowing us down. If this blue packet were to leave right now, at the output logger, we could say that it would write its own packet access logs out to memory, and then we would let the packet go. So once again, no cross-core access is here. We're doing great in terms of performance. Unfortunately, this approach doesn't actually work. And what it doesn't actually work, because we actually require these packet access logs here in order to replay the system up to and including when we release this blue packet. Now the reason why may not be clear just yet, but assuming we need these guys, it should be clear why we have a problem. Because if I let this blue packet go, and the master middle box fails right now, I would lack the data that I need in order to do correct replay. And for this reason, the output logger needs to check before releasing a packet, that it has all the packet access logs that it needs to replay. And if it doesn't, then it needs to hold on to the packet and not let it go until it has all the data that it needs. So what do we need to check for? Let's plot on a chart here on the left, and as a red packet comes in, we'll put our first packet access log in our chart. It accesses X, and it's going to move forward and access Y. We'll add another packet access log here. And I've drawn an arrow from one packet access log to the other. That arrow represents that in order to replay this event, I have to replay this event first. The packet came in, it updated X, then it updated Y. So in order to replay whatever happened at Y, I need to replay what happened at X first. If I were to let this red packet go now, I would need both of those packet access logs to correctly replay what happened when that packet was processed by the system. Now here comes a yellow packet. The yellow packet updates X, and once again, we're gonna create a packet access log. But we're gonna draw an arrow back here to this previous packet access log as well. Now, why is that? Well, in order to replay what happened when yellow got to X, we have to be able to replay everything that happened to X previously. And so we need to draw an arrow back to the most recent packet access log that updated X in order to know what to do when yellow packet gets there. So if we let this yellow packet go just now, we would need these two packet access logs, follow the arrows back, in order to know that we can safely release the packet. And here comes a final example, a blue packet. And our blue packet comes in and it accesses Y. Once again, we generate a packet access log, and we need to replay everything that happened to Y before the blue packet got there. So we have an arrow to the most recent packet access log that updated Y, and we can trace all of the blue packet's dependencies, the things that it rely on, by following those arrows backwards. I could continue drawing these trees here. There's a whole literature of ways to represent these kinds of dependencies, but I really want you to notice just one thing. These dependencies exist across different cores. And so in order to track dependencies, we're somehow going to need to track data that exists across cores. And this is the thing that we knew was expensive. So if I want to use a strict algorithm to track dependencies, I'm going to require an algorithm that has about n times c cross-core accesses, where n is the number of variables in my system and c is the number of cores. When we implemented one such algorithm, we could only sustain a throughput of about 600,000 packets per second. 
but we needed to be forwarding at a rate of millions of packets per second. So this was just too slow. So the thing that makes FTMB faster than other replay-based approaches is the ability to quickly check that all of the packet access logs have been stored. And we're going to use, do it using only order C, order number of cores, number of cross-core accesses. This is the key thing that ordered logging and parallel release make fast. So here's how that works. With ordered logging, whenever a packet comes in and generates a packet access log, we don't carry the packet access log with us. We immediately write it out to the output queue before we even release the lock on the data that we're operating on. Now, this is a very simple change, but it gives us two really nice guarantees. Here's the first guarantee. All of the packet access logs that a given packet could possibly depend on are either already in these queues or have already been written out. There's no looking back into the system. There's no tracing. Everything I need must already be in these queues. And the second thing that I know is that there are only C such queues to look into. So now, instead of explicitly tracing these dependencies, when this yellow packet shows up, I know that if I could just flush everything out in one go like this, I would have pushed everything that the yellow packet depends on out to the output logger. And I would be completely safe to let my yellow packet go. Now, the only trick here is that the NIC doesn't flush things all in one go. It reads from the queues one by one. So the only thing that parallel release does is it checks once such a flush has completed. Here's how we implement that. Every time I create a new packet access log, I'm going to increment a counter. This counter is local to the core that I'm on. So this says that there are two packet access logs in Q1 and one packet access log that have been generated for Q2. And as more packets are processed, we'll generate more packet access logs, update the counters, and we can do all of this in parallel with no coordination. Now, eventually, the NIC is going to want to read out some data from that queue. And so at that point, we're going to do our necessary cross-core reads. If I want to release this batch of packets here, I'm first going to read the values of all of these counters. Now, these values are telling me that if I want to safely release the blue and yellow packet, I need to have two packet access logs stored from this first queue and two packet access logs stored from the second queue. So I'll copy that data into a vector with one timestamp for each core, and I'll push the batch out all together. Now at the other side, at the output logger, we'll keep a corresponding set of counters. And as the packet access logs are read in, I'll update my counters. And then when I want to release the data packets, I can check my vector against the values that I already have at the output logger. And my vector tells me that although I have all the packet access logs I need from here, I don't have the ones I need from here. So these guys are going to have to wait. And they'll wait until that top queue there finishes its flush, and then I'll be able to let them go. So that's it. That's parallel release. And it's so fast that we can release packets. We can release, sorry, it's so fast that we can commit state every time we release a batch of packets. That is every few microseconds. Fault tolerance is almost never implemented on those time scales. So we've really specialized what we're doing to our packet processing domain, and let's see how this pans out against some other systems. Here's a bar chart of throughput for six middle boxes that ran in our test bed. Now, these guys are forwarding somewhere between 1.5 and 6.25 million packets per second. When we add on generating the packet access logs, implementing the ordered logging and the parallel release, things drop by between 1 and 25 percent. When we add on a further layer, our snapshotting, we lose a few more 100,000 packets per second, leading to an end-to-end -end performance penalty between 5 and 30 percent. And so we can continue to forward at a rate of millions of packets per second, but now we have this nice guarantee that we're never releasing data that we can't prove that we could reconstruct uh, should the master fail. Here we can also compare against Scribe, which is a recent replay-based system that's actually quite cool. 
it can run arbitrary binary code inside of the system and it'll do replay very similar to how FTMB does it. But because it's not specific to packet processing, they're actually automatically detecting where data races happen in the hypervisor, this cost to detect the packet access logs for them is pretty expensive. And so they can only forward it about 500 packets per second. That's just 500. Yes. Can you comment on which ones of these middle boxes, if all of them, uh, actually require these very powerful ordering restraints you're giving? Because I can imagine some middle boxes don't actually need this very powerful right. property. Right, so part of our goal here was to design something that was going to be generic. A lot of what people do today, like we went to one of these vendors and said, what's your fault tolerance algorithm? And they like brought out a guy. And the guy like sat around thinking about what ordering constraints you did or didn't need. What's nice about this is that it just works. Um, so for some things, it probably doesn't matter, like TCP has some pretty forgiving recovery mechanisms, but the thing that's good about this is that we don't have to care. No one has to reason about that part of the problem. Okay, now we can talk about latency. So this is a CDF of per packet latencies, and this is for a middle box called Mazunat that was written by one Mr. Uh, Eddie Kohler. So uh, by default, Coming in and out of our system, we have a median latency of 70 microseconds. And when a packet comes in and out, that's, that's what we've got. Now here's what happens when you add on a whole bunch of other fault tolerance mechanisms. The latencies go up. So here's our pink line here. This is Pico. Pico is the only one of the systems we're going to compare against that targets middle boxes directly. Pico uses a checkpointing based approach. If you recall from earlier, checkpointing based approaches are the ones that increase latency. So end-to-end -end Pico adds on a per packet latency overhead of 8 milliseconds. Now this red line here is another checkpoint based approach, but it's not targeted to the middle box domain. Consequently, it has higher overheads of about 50 milliseconds per packet. Now underneath that red line is a system called Colo. Colo is one of these active-active approaches, the ones that rely on the system being mostly deterministic. Now, Colo freezes up. It tries to counteract for the non-determinism that's happening in between the two copies of the system. And it ran for a pretty short while and allowed us to take these measurements. But unfortunately, it shortly thereafter crashed because the load of the number of non-deterministic events it was observing were too much for it to handle. Now, here's the blue line, and that's FTMB. So FTMB has a median latency penalty of 30 microseconds. The end-to-end -end overhead is only 100 microseconds. This is orders of magnitude better than the other systems, and we show in the paper that FTMB is the only system with latency, over latency overheads that are low enough such that a user won't notice the costs while web browsing. Now, one interesting bit here, though, the tail is not looking quite as good. Now, why is that? Well, we've optimized this cost of logging the non-deterministic events down so that they're not the bottleneck over more anymore. The bottleneck is now the snapshot time. So if I looked at the raw latency numbers over time, there's a graph actually in the paper, what we'd see is that under normal operation, the latency is very low, and then periodically you get these spikes. And this is the snapshot interval. Every time we take a snapshot, the system slows down, and that's where the latency cost is coming from. So I've been to VMware, I've spoken with folks who are working to bring that snapshot time in. And they're not doing that just for us, they're doing it for their wide range of customers who use VM snapshotting for a lot of different applications. So we would expect that in time, this tail would come in as well. Okay, so to recap, FTMB uses rollback recovery to restore lost state after a master middle box goes down. We log all the packets that a middle box has processed at this input logger. We generate packet access logs to counteract all the non-deterministic events at replay time, and we'll log them at the downstream switch. We never release a packet unless we have everything we need in order to guarantee that we can replay the system up to and including that very packet. Okay, so that concludes our discussion of FTMB. To pause and take any questions about FTMB before I move forward. We're good? Okay, great. So, uh, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, is there an abstract uh, 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 interpretation of what's going on here? I mean, the correctness of this algorithm. Mm -hmm. 
uh, a more abstract way of saying this thing. So that, uh, why this is correct? Why is this correct? Yeah. So this is correct because? because I have serialized the operations to all shared data. And so I've logged the order of the original execution. But, uh, so I've logged the original execution, and now at replay time, I replay them in the exact same order. So I've guaranteed that they've done the same thing both times. Okay. So you have a serialization. Basically, you enforce a serialization. Not at uh, runtime. At the under normal operation, things just run in whatever order they're going to, and we just log whatever happened. And then at replay time, we enforce that whenever you try and access one of those pieces of shared data, it goes through in the same order that it did the first time through. Okay. Okay. So uh, we've only got a little bit of time left, but I briefly like to talk about Blindbox and Embark before discussing future directions for middleboxes as cloud services. Fortunately, this part is going to be uh, pretty brief, but I can talk a lot more about it uh, offline. So privacy. Long been a concern in cloud computing. We're worried about this guy right here. Now that I've redirected all of my traffic to and from the cloud, or really allowed any middle box to operate over my data, I've granted them the ability to read all of my messages I'm sending over the internet. And even if the client does mostly trust their cloud provider, how can they be sure that the cloud provider servers aren't going to get compromised? That they don't have just one administrator who's a little bit curious about what's going on. This is where Blindbox and Embark come in. Blindbox and Embark are two systems which allow middleboxes to inspect and modify traffic while it remains encrypted. The way they work is by developing two new functional cryptography techniques called prefix match and keyword match. And Blindbox and Embark can both maintain user privacy, provide the benefits of network packet processing, and still have reasonably good performance. The difference between Blindbox and Embark is that Blindbox focuses specifically on applications that read payload data, like intrusion detection systems. And Embark generalizes to a broader class of devices, like we outsourced in APLUM. I'm just going to sketch how Blindbox works at a very high level. Here we have Alice and Bob, who've come together. They want to communicate over a network. And they know who this guy McAfee is. McAfee or Symantec, emerging threats. These are all the companies that today go out and do all the analysis of what malware looks like, and they generate rule sets about what's good and what's bad out there on the internet. Now, Alice and Bob know who this guy is, but they don't trust this guy so much. Maybe it's their cloud provider. Maybe it's the university they're at. Maybe it's a cafe. This guy wants to perform packet processing over their traffic. It wants to detect these terms in their communications. And Alice and Bob think that's kind of nice, right? They'd like to be protected from each other if one of them turns out to be malicious. But they don't want to hand over the ability to the middle box that it be able to read all of their data. So here's how we solve that. McAfee, or the uh, company here, you guys are giggling. OK. Uh, our company here is going to encrypt the data in a special way, and it's going to ship it over to the middle box. And now Alice and Bob are going to use a special encryption scheme called Blindbox HTTPS that's compatible with McAfee's encryption. And if Bob sends the message, I love Harvard, the middle box is going to learn virtually nothing about the data because there's no match with what's in here. But if Bob sends the message, attack Harvard, the middle box will see the present of the term attack and be able to block it. So this is nice, because now Alice and Bob have the protection of the middle box, but their data remains encrypted so long as there are no matches in this rule set. The technique that we use to implement Blindbox HTTPS is called searchable encryption. It's a classic approach, or it's a, it's a well-known approach in, search, in functional cryptography. And what we did was we designed a new form of searchable encryption that was secure and fast enough for network packet processing rates. Fortunately, I don't have a lot of time to talk about all the details of that. Instead, I'm going to move on and talk about what's next. Now, I think that there are two ways to think about research going forward in general. First, one can ask, well, what's left to realize this vision of outsourced middle boxes and services? And second, once this vision is realized, what does this change for us in networking in the future? One step towards realizing the vision is impact in industry. 
APLOM-like services are now offered by startups like Ariaka and Zscaler. And one of the things I'm really excited about right now is that AT&T has announced a project called Domain 2.0. And the idea here is that they will offer middle box services, not in big clouds, but on their own infrastructure at the edge, near where your company or your home link up to their infrastructure directly. FTMB has been published by ETSI, which is the European Telecommunication Standards Institute. I don't really know what's European about them, given that they represent every telco you've ever heard of and all of their vendors and manufacturers, but they've released this to this group of over 200 members worldwide. And finally, the FTMB algorithms are in trials at two major NFV and IDS vendors whose logos I don't get to put up here. There's also a lot of research that's left to do. And here are just a few examples. We talked today about how middle boxes are parallel within a multi-core server. But what happens if I want to scale out across multiple devices together? How do they share data, data between each other? Middle boxes are also traditionally deployed in a single domain with one administrator, with one policy, with one privacy setting. But how do we build middle boxes that are shared among lots of users like we're going to need to do in the cloud? How do we build multi-tenant middle boxes? What about usability? We started off this whole discussion talking about how middle box management was so difficult for network administrators. But we've never gone back and done a usability study to ask whether or not the changes that we're proposing are actually going to improve things for the folks on the ground. Looking out a bit further, middle boxes confront us with the fact that not only can our network traffic be monitored, but it is constantly tracked. Cryptographers and protocol analysts have done a great job formally defining what tools like SSL or Blindbox are going to reveal about our communications. And there are proofs that show what these things do or don't reveal. But what's really hard to reason about is what happens up at the application layer. How do I build systems? How do I build applications that want to maintain any sort of privacy in a world where I'm being constantly monitored and I only have leaky protocols to protect myself? Hence, I think all sorts of research that's in this space of helping application developers think more about building systems that provide privacy is going to be increasingly important in the future. Another thing that we can look going forward is a future where public infrastructure in clouds and ISPs is programmable. So today, Netflix deploys special content services caching in ISPs all over the world. And here's their highly sophisticated and technical mechanism for doing so. They call someone up. They say, we would like to put our box in your network. They mail the box to the ISP, and someone at the ISP plugs it in for them. So if you're a student, and you have some new idea, or you're a researcher, or you're a startup, these are actually things that people have come and talked to me about, you have no chance of deploying this on public infrastructure anywhere. But I think in the near future, if AT&T delivers on domain 2.0, if cloud services offer more hooks to program network functionality, what we're going to see is that we have a new platform for apps built into the network. And with that, I'll conclude and take any questions. Thank you very much. So we started off thinking, oh, we're in the cloud, we have all the software, we want to have this general software-based approach to do failover for software middle boxes. And the big thing here was that the boxes that people are used to thinking about, you like go to your vendor, they ship you two copies of the same box, you have to pay for it twice over, and there's some custom protocol there. And if we were doing everything in the cloud, we needed to do some everything in this generic running and software sort of, sort of way. But it turns out that lots of people are moving back the other way, saying, well, I am an enterprise and I'm not outsourcing, but I want to run a rack of computers that runs all of my middle box services. And they could use the FTMB services as well. So we started coming at it from the cloud service, cloud direction, but it certainly backports back to the enterprise as well. So it's not, for example, the ability to do the, the virtual machine you can run that. Can, so we use Zen, which is the same. You know, Amazon uses Zen. We can download Zen. VMware ships virtual machines, snapshotting stuff too. Is it is one way to think about it that um, 
you have the flexibility to either rebuild the, the software page router or in this case mobile services it's kind of afforded by cloud technology but in a, a different way than you certainly see them coming together a lot lately. So there's this big movement, and especially in ISPs, called network functions virtualization. And basically, they're tired of buying dedicated boxes and wiring them together. They, they see what all the nice cloud people have. They can spin up services on demand, scale them down. They have general scheduling frameworks. They have generic software that runs on generic infrastructure. And they want all of those nice things that the cloud people have. Um, and so this sort of runs in parallel to that, although they're sort of focusing on how one runs an ISP, and I'm more looking at what would we do to make things better for enterprises. Yes? So can you comment on how some of your logging and replay techniques relate to uh, people, work that people have done on like multi-threaded logging and replay? It seems like there's some similar issues there. Yeah, so one of the things that's actually really different is uh, just a difference in setting. Um, almost all of the multi-threaded logging stuff is all about debugging. So they simply log a lot more than we do. So things that we don't log include calls to malloc. It matters a lot for debugging where the memory sits. But for us, if you're just trying to reconstruct the content of the state, that doesn't matter to us at all. Um, the other thing is that for speed, and because there are few pieces of shared state variables, we can actually go in at the application layer and say, here are where the races are going to happen. In the big general case, that's super hard to do. But if you go talk to the folks who build these things, they know where they're all going to happen, because they've been trying to optimize that stuff out. And those are the variables that they hate. Yes? Did you actually evaluate? I mean, I'm sure you did. What happened when you pulled the plug and tried to fail over? So we have uh, replay recovery time. Um, so we, we don't show the sort of end-to-end -end failure detector time, because it's sort of dependent on when you do recovery. Um, but we have how long it takes to do, sorry? At replay? No, the replay, it was, uh, there was actually some really interesting stuff here. Let me, oh, oops. Let me pull this back up. Um, so replay takes like more or less time depending on how long your checkpoint interval is and how complex the device is. And what's funny is that for like shorter checkpoint intervals and not very complicated devices, replay time is faster than normal operation. And that's because under normal operation, you don't run at 100% load. And we would just say process this data as fast as you can so long as you're keeping up with the same execution order. But then when things start to get longer or the middle box starts to get more complex, you start to see them saying, oh, I got here and I want to update this variable, but the system won't let me because it's not my turn. And so you start to see contention there, replay time. Um, so I thought that was an interesting result of recovery time. Was, it, was there any, I mean, one could imagine some ways that you could verify uh -huh. that you had replayed exactly the same state. Did you like ever? We didn't go that? and do that. We just sort of looked at whether or not things would sort of keep running, whether or not, yeah, yeah. Done. Yeah, so but bugs. you're right that we could have gone through sort of and said. So you know you have some bugs there. Do you, can you characterize what? Sorry? The, you must have bugs. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like if you, if you haven't verified it, right. then you definitely have some bugs. You probably even have an idea of what some of those bugs might so, be. So, oh, sorry. Like. One of the things that we did do <laughs> is that we verified that the replay reproduced the same output. Right, so long as we got the same output, we assumed it was good. But I think what you're pushing at that would have been nicer would be to go in and look at the content of the variables themselves and see whether or not they match up. That's what we didn't do. We did verify that at replay time, the same packets came out. That would be simple just compared to two states, right? He's in theory, so when he says that would be simple. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For some of this data, it could be simple. Sometimes the, the thing is, is that we were trying not to put any constraints on what this state was. Sometimes it's a hash table. So you know, maybe there was a rehash here and there wasn't a rehash there. I don't know. But they actually contain the same data. So it's not like there's a generic way to compare what's sitting there in memory without thinking through it. Sometimes it's very easy to compare the two because they're two counters and they hold the same value. Um, but everything that we were trying to do was trying not to place constraints on what state the developers might want to have. We just said, this is data that can be accessed by multiple cores. The end. We will protect it. Um, yeah. 
it can be done. It might be worth yeah, more. Yes. Um, so it, I, I get the feeling, are you going to work on middle boxes forever? No. Uh, but middle boxes are super cool. And here's the thing, like, if we have general compute stuff, like, it's so much easier to code middle boxes than, say, it was when someone was writing the click modular router. And it's not just the click modular router. It's DPDK. It's NetMap. It's all of these, like, lovely things that we have for designing packet processing. So I think that no matter what networking research I'm doing in the future, my students are going to be really glad that they have these tools that people did not have in the past. Um, things that I am also worried about are that I've built the latest, greatest monitoring framework for oppressive government of your choice. I don't know a lot about privacy research, and that's one of the things that I've been most excited about is all of the privacy people I've talked to on this tour. But I think there are a lot of sort of open questions going forward about what things that we might want to build given the programmable infrastructure or what privacy concerns we should be worried about given the programmable infrastructure. But at some point, I hope to say everyone's using NFV. We know how to do NFV. You know, middle boxes are all managed in software, and it's just cloudy and lovely, and there are no interesting research problems there anymore. All right, let's uh, thank the speaker one last time.